Samantha Lorenberg, who is a reporter that normally covers politics in New York, has been sitting in on the last couple days of the Jonathan Majors trial. She's a guest on Roland Martin Unfiltered, and she recently broke down two different interviews that Roland Martin had done, one with Priya Chaudhry about the Adam Foss case, and another with Kaiser Gondrizic, the former ex-girlfriend of Kevin Porter Jr., NBA player. If you're not familiar with either of those names, Adam Foss was a former prosecutor in Suffolk County in Massachusetts, and on November 17th, 2020, a woman named Reagan Seeley wrote a Medium blog post called The Wolf and the Whisper Network, where she alleges that there's a rapist and a feminist T, a predator hiding in plain sight, And she accuses Adam Foss by name of raping her in a New York hotel room in 2017. Years after she wrote this blog post, the Manhattan DA decided to bring charges against him because it allegedly happened in a New York hotel room. Now, the theory of the Manhattan prosecution's case, and I go over all of this in in depth in an hour and a half long video on my channel. I'll link it in the description if you want to check it out. And there's really not that much available about this case except for the news coverage initially that a prosecutor was being charged with an egregious crime. Now, Priya Chaudhry was his defense attorney, and she has suggested both to the press and live while speaking with Roland Martin that Adam Foss is taking legal action against the Manhattan DA for their conduct in this case. A spokesperson from Alvin Bragg's office also made a statement after the full unanimous acquittal was announced and said, survivors of sexual assault deserve to have their day in court, and our prosecutors fight every day to center and uplift their voices. While we are disappointed, we sincerely thank the jury for its service and respect the verdict it rendered. As such, we will decline to comment further at this time. Now, Priya Chaudhry had gotten a little bit more vocal with a outlet called News One, where Chaudhry claims that Alvin Bragg ignored evidence that should have precluded any criminal charges against Foss. Claims similar to those she's made about the district attorney's office case against Jonathan Majors, who stands accused of domestic violence. Chaudhry also questioned the ethics of Bragg's office and cited an eagerness to bring, quote, that's eagerness, end quote, to bring hasty criminal charges, particularly when a black man is accused of violent crime by a white woman. Because it was clear to everyone that this case should never have been brought due to the overwhelming evidence of Mr. False's innocence and total lack of credible evidence of the allegations, twice I made outreach efforts directly to DA Alvin Bragg prior to trial including sending an eight-page letter that laid out the overwhelming exculpatory evidence and critical problems with this office's troubling conduct in initiating this case. Chaudhry said in one of two statements emailed to News 1 this weekend, this was November 5th, DA Bragg totally ignored my outreach efforts and never agreed to even speak with me. And then we see another common thread, the news coverage, especially in the initial accusation phase. While initial reports of false allegations against Mr. Foss were widespread and vigorous, the news of Mr. Foss's acquittal has been met with a noticeable silence, save for mentions by a handful of outlets. And that's true, because there's like four that come up before it gets into other stuff when I do a search. Chaudhry continued, This selective reporting does not serve the public interest and falls short of the media's duty to report not just allegations, but also resolutions, especially acquittals. The narrative around Mr. Foss's case demands a balanced examination, and we urge all media outlets to fulfill their role in providing comprehensive coverage of the entire story, including his complete vindication. Notably, and we'll get to this, Chaudhry ripped Bragg's office for allegedly deferring to, quote, social media posts as purported evidence instead of relying on a foundation of solid evidence, saying, it is troubling and undermines the principles of due process and justice. Now, what did we see in the Majors case with some of this reaction? If, if you go out and try to, at least in my personal experience, I'm sure others can relate, If you go out and you say something about the evidence in the Jonathan Majors case, there's a good chance you're going to be met with a response about this Rolling Stone article brought to you by none other than Cheyenne Roundtree and Althea Legaspi, women who are still unnamed. But even though I did a deep dive on the Adam Foss case, I'm going to take you through a little walkthrough of what the social media and the other accusers looked like in that case. Back to Chaudhry's statements. Furthermore, there is a concerning trend within the Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg's office to weaponize accusations where a black man is accused by a white woman, casting aside the need for robust evidence in favor of a narrative-driven prosecution. This represents a misapplication of justice, fueled by societal biases that have no place in the system pledged to fairness and equality. Bragg's office has strayed from its mission to impartially uphold the law. Instead, it has drifted toward a path of character assassination and publicity-driven prosecution. Now let's wind it back to how this case unfolded. So on your screen right now is the press release that the DA's office, that Alvin Bragg's office, released when they indicted Adam Foss. DA Bragg announces indictment of prosecutor Impact founder Adam Foss for raping a woman while she slept. 
So we see for raping a woman while she slept in a Manhattan hotel room in October 2017, he is charged in New York Supreme Court with rape in the first degree and sexual abuse in the first degree. I thank this brave survivor who had the courage to come forward and share her story. According to documents and statements made on the record in court, on October 21, 2017, Foss, a former prosecutor and public speaker, met the 25-year-old survivor at a Midtown hotel after exchanging calls and texts for approximately one month. After the survivor repeatedly said no to Foss's sexual advances, the two fell asleep before Foss allegedly raped the before Foss allegedly raped the woman as she slept. Now, an argument in their case is that she was unable to consent because she, even after she awoke, she was physically helpless to move. So she couldn't do anything because she was physically helpless. Now, let's go over to this November 17th, 2022 blog. So that's three years and almost one month after the incident itself. I'm not going to go into all of this. I go over everything in the case in a full deep dive on the Adam Foss video, but let it be known that I had an aha moment while reading this post, because remember what I just said. Prosecution argued that it was rape because she was unable to consent and she was physically helpless to move or do anything. She just woke up and laid there. But in this blog post, which is still public, so she describes this hotel meet as their first real sexual contact. So they're in this hotel room, and she goes into it describing the conversations back and forth. She describes saying stop and thinking maybe he thinks it's just playful. Then he says fine, night Reagan, according to her, and he gets into the covers and rolls away. I suddenly felt very naked and quickly slipped in beside him. After a minute or so, he spun around and buried his face in my chest, childish, and pushed my legs up into his lap. You're beautiful, he mumbled, and just hugged him back. I felt like his mother. Here was the sad, lonely drunk of our late-night calls who just wanted to cuddle. He quickly fell into a drunken slumber, loudly snoring. A few hours later, while it was still dark, something woke me up. Adams woke me up. It was inside me. I was in too much shock to say anything. I didn't tell him to stop. I froze. But she goes on to say that they continued talking and speaking in the relationship. She wanted to link back up with him. She would get upset when he wasn't answering her back. And she tries to rationalize this in the blog post to say, I didn't really understand what happened to me until my friends told me later. But one of the things that she says about this one single sexual encounter that she later goes on to say she was helpless to consent and just laid there physically helpless, she says that one of the texts she sent him after this one sexual encounter, she kind of gives something away that doesn't make that theory add up. Back home, Adam texted and asked what I was doing. I told him I was in bed thinking about writing his again. I'm always wet for you, man. You drive me crazy, I wrote. It was imperative I regain my sexual prowess as soon as possible. The last thing I wanted was for him to think I hadn't enjoyed myself. So how are you laying there physically helpless, unable to do anything to stop it, but you are you have the text message and then you're putting it in this Medium blog post? You are doing something that requires some physical work. As I went through looking at this case, I was like, damn, the inconsistency is right in this blog post. The exculpatory evidence is right in this blog post. And then presumably there's a text message record somewhere of this that came into the case. So she's saying she texted it to him. But yet the Manhattan DA came out and pressed these charges saying that the woman was helpless. Now, Reagan Steely took the Me Too route where it was requested and you can see it at the bottom of this Medium blog post. It's tagged as Me Too, Time's Up Movement, Sexual Assault, and Feminism. And there's a call to action that whispers, do not stop wolves. It's time to shout. If you had an experience that you'd like to share with people who have gone through the same thing or something similar, please reach out. You're not alone. Since posting this piece, a number of women have publicly shared their experiences of harm inflicted by Adam across social media, and others have reached out to me personally. You can find these stories across platforms under the hashtag Adam John Foss. And then there's a Twitter thread where people, she shares people's stories. Now, this was alluded to in trial. And the prosecution wanted to bring these tweets in. They wanted to bring these social media screenshots in, into trial. It's just as awareness of the post being out there, not the witnesses testifying themselves. Another thing worth noting is just like it's sort of being suggested with the Jonathan Majors case, where while Grace Jabari was testifying, there seemed to be a group of supporters that didn't appear to be family members or direct first degree friends with Grace Jabari that were coming in to sit there for her. This is the same courthouse that this Adam Foss case was tried in. And in the Adam Foss trial, a group of alleged survivors and victims were coming to sit in the court every day. And when I say victims, I want you to decide for yourself. One person who attended his trial who claims to be a victim, this is her rationale for being a victim. 
We hadn't seen each other in person since I was a 24-year-old assistant and he was trying to fuck at a conference. I didn't know what he'd make of me now, 31, and connected to other women he'd hurt over the years. But as the trial started, I worried about getting stuck with his lawyer, Priya Chaudhry, on the ride up to the sixth floor. I knew, I knew, I wouldn't be able to stop myself from asking that classic cliche question, how do you sleep at night? That's all I have to say about Priya Chaudhry. And that person has written their own blog posts and participated in social media posts about Adam Foss, but their entire claim to victimhood is that he tried to fuck her. There was no, they didn't have sex with each other, there was no encounter, but I guess that's enough to co-opt someone else's alleged victimhood. And I have a problem with that because, just like we're seeing with Jonathan Majors, we get these numbers, two dozen sources. You get those big numbers adding up, and it sounds like two dozen people are corroborating the story, the main story, the main claim. But then you find out one of them's like, well, no, he tried to talk to me once. That's not the same thing. So there's this thread here, and there are these vague claims that are being shared. A lot of them are vague posts that come in. Some of them are anonymous that are just being reshared. Some are directly posted on X by an, a separate account. But me too, nine years later, and he's still preying on women the same age as I was when I met him. Thanks for being brave to share your story, Reagan Seeley, and shame on Ted for remaining silent and inactive because he was a TED Talk. He was a TED speaker. I was an intern and shadowed him the summer before my senior year of high school. I should have reported it at the time, but I didn't. I didn't think anyone would believe me. But we don't know what. And then here it says he intentionally and repeatedly focused his attention on women younger than that. So is the what just paying attention to somebody? Because so far we're seeing 25 and 24 were the ages. And then this one. I've, I've received so many DMs and emails from women who are still scared to put their names out there because of who this man is. Hi, please don't share my name, but my friend just sent me your medium. I had a very similar situation with Adam. I was early 20s, adult, in New York City when he met me. All the texts seemed so similar. I'm so sorry this happened to you, too. That could be bad, right? That could be bad. This could be a second person that has the same behavior, the same alleged story. But then it goes on. He would text me sweet names and always sexual, then disappear for hours and days. We had sex multiple times, and I was pushed into it a few times. Okay, pause. That's bad. If I didn't want to have sex, he would stay up drinking all night while I went to sleep. These two sentences there don't reconcile. We had sex multiple times and I was pushed into it a few times. That's bad. But also, if I didn't want to have sex, I would go to sleep. We wouldn't have sex. He would stay up drinking. I went to sleep. And then this one, this is another one of the accusers. This is being lumped in as all these women coming forward. Now let's see what it says. Wolf, I just wanted to reach out and say I'm so sorry that happened to you. My heart hurts to read about the experience you went through and that of so many others. I also wanted to say thank you a million times over. I was introduced to Adam in college through a professor who brought him to class as a speaker. We followed each other on Instagram and started DMing. The message turned from friendly to inappropriate and unprofessional. That's gross, right? I was caught between feeling gross and uncomfortable and wanting to continue the conversation. I was caught. So you have no agency now. I was caught between feeling gross and uncomfortable and wanting to continue the conversation as he was offering me mentorship and potential job opportunities. I cannot thank you enough for sharing your story. If I had not read about this, I very well could have met up with him in person and accepted a job under him. And I do not want to envision where that could have taken me. You do not want to envision where it could have taken you. You have saved myself and countless other women from so much potential harm. I'm truly so grateful and I stand with you and support you. So how, like, this is the example. You have these long paragraphs and it's just being lumped together as all these other women are coming forward with their experiences. But this person's experience is simply feeling caught between feeling gross and wanting the potential job opportunities. But they're adding to that number to corroborate the egregious accusation. And then this was, she shared some of the messages, and it's them talking back and forth, planning to call each other while he's on vacation, apparently with his girlfriend at the time. They send a picture, there's a zebra here and a dog. So, there's that. This started backwards. Alvin Bride's office decided to go after Adam Fox, and they did this by initiating this case, and... All of the evidence collected by Alvin Bragg's office showed one thing and one thing only, that this woman is not telling the truth. So we don't even have a situation where 
the prosecutor is even pretending to do the prosecutor's job, which is to take police reports, start investigating, making a decision as a officer of the court, whether there is evidence, whether they believe the evidence to look for whether there's evidence not to believe this person and then deciding a charging decision. This- so I did a full deep dive on really anything I could find the ins and outs of the Adam Foss case. If you want to look at that in more detail, there's a video on my channel. I think I posted it like November 13th or something like that. So go and check that out. And then now let's get into the Kevin Porter Jr. situation, which is also Alvin Bragg's office, the Manhattan DA. And there's all these parallels again. And I really don't like to compare the specifics of a case. But in this situation, we do have a a wildfire news coverage of a strangulation charge to the point where it was being reported that Kevin Porter Jr. fractured or broke a vertebrae in Kaiser Gondrizic, his girlfriend at the time's neck, because of him strangling her. And when this story first came out, I was, I, I, there's a comment somewhere on, on Twitter where I'm like, oh, you're not escaping that one. Like something like that, where that's, yeah, no, mm-mm, you can't overcome that one. That's kind of how I felt. And the news was everywhere. Now, Kevin Porter Jr. is an NBA player. So, you know, this obviously affected his reputation and his contracts. And it's also bad for Kaiser Gondrizic because not only does it look like she made false accusations because it usually comes off as the accuser is testifying to the things that happened and at least somewhat cooperating, Mm -hmm. made some type of statement with the Manhattan DA. But she's also a WNBA player, so she's an athlete, and she's a model. She's a signed model. I think she's, like, with Wilhelmina or something like that. Like, she's beautiful. And unlike me, you know, models have good posture. And so someone from the DA's office was eavesdropping the morning after this all happened, after Kevin Porter Jr. was arrested, and they were just, like, eavesdropping it, and there were no medical records sent to the DA yet. And this person from the DA's office, this investigator, overheard something and didn't understand what they were hearing. So they took a discussion about a congenital defect, something that Kaiser Gondrizic has had, and they turned it into a story that her something in her spine, her vertebrae, was fractured, broken, whatever, during this supposed altercation with Kevin Porter Jr. And that story pumped out into the media immediately. So even the Associated Press, back in September... Houston Rockets guard Kevin Porter Jr.'s alleged attack on his girlfriend in New York City hotel room left the woman with a fractured neck vertebrae and a deep cut above her right eye, prosecutors reveal in his arraignment on Tuesday. So he's charged with felony assault and strangulation, and he did not want to enter a plea at the time of his arraignment. He was ordered to post $75,000 cash or obtain a $100,000 bond and ordered to stay away from Gondrizic. So back to me admitting where I jumped to conclusions. And again, it was Jimmy that sent me this video that uh, the Roland Martin show covered. So Kaiser Gondrizic got on the show with Roland Martin and broke down. He's never hit me. He's never been physical with me. That night, I stood up and I fell. And there's even a smear on the wall in the hotel room. And she says that I'm not doing this for Kevin. I'm doing it for me. And she has a lawyer retained that's helping her navigate this situation as she deals with the ADA. We'll get into those details. But in short, here's me walking back my assumption that I fell for. The Kevin Porter Jr. situation is one I 100% believed as soon as I heard there was a fractured vertebrae. But there was no fractured vertebrae. I still didn't want to unplant my feet until I was halfway through what Kaiser was saying in that Roland Martin interview. I'll link to that. You can watch it in full. You can also watch Lauren Burke's, you know, recap of it. She did a really concise job putting clips together. But I had to go through the interview and even Roland Martin had to have her confirm like, wait, so he's never been physical with you. And she's like, at all. No, absolutely not. So shout out to Jimmy for all the things he's doing. He's back in court today right now for Verdict Watch. Um, He showed up in the court to make sure someone was there on the last day of Grace Jabari's cross-examination. And he's also following stories like this. and, And I'm happy he sent it my way because not only did it correct my own belief, but it's showing another thing that the Manhattan DA overcharged because they overheard something. They didn't even wait for medical records. And then this story spreads like wildfire through the news to the point where Kaiser Gondrizic says she had to get in touch with the doctor that she spoke with. And he had to go do an interview with Fox News to go up there and say, that's not what happened. Because somehow the prosecutors had this information and it made it to the media. Kaiser Gondrizic didn't go to the media. 
And that could open her up to lawsuits if it looks like she did. And what did we see with that strangulation charge with the Jonathan Majors arrest? How quickly was that in the news? Now, there is a quote that sounds exactly like Sergeant Henson in the Jonathan Majors trial. Right when the story broke, the New York Post covered what was going on with the arrest. And look at this quote. It's very familiar. It reminds me a lot of what Sergeant Henson said that Grace Jabari told police officers about, he struck me multiple times in the head and put his hands around my throat. When officers arrived, they found Porter's 26-year-old girlfriend, Kaiser Gundrizik, who previously played for the Indiana Fever in Chicago Sky, with a cut on her face and suffering neck pain, cops and sources said. Porter allegedly hit Gundrizik multiple times and placed his hands around her neck, cops said. But meanwhile, Gundrizik says, my injuries don't support any of those claims. And she adds that the Manhattan District Attorney's Office and cops were to blame for the inaccuracies. He didn't hit me, he never balled up his fist and hit me, Gundrizik insisted. And he definitely didn't punch me in the face numerous times. That is a lie. I don't have any injuries to support that. But Assistant District Attorney Myra Kurzer conceded during a hearing in Manhattan Criminal Court on Monday that the injury, which has since been determined to be a congenital defect, wasn't actually caused by the NBA star. Well, yeah, that's what congenital defect means. It's not caused by someone else. As a result, the DA's office said it was tossing Porter's second-degree assault charge due to insufficient evidence. And prosecutors repeat, that Gundrizik told cops Porter struck her multiple times with a closed fist. Porter then allegedly forcefully squeezed her neck with his hands, which caused her to experience difficulty breathing, redness, and bruising to her neck, and substantial pain, the criminal complaint against him states. The alleged beating only ended when Gundrizik fled the room and was found bloodied and bruised by hotel employees in the hall. That's who called 911, not, Ky- not Kaiser. Gundrizik, however, claimed that the DA's office didn't wait to interview her or get full access to her medical records before releasing details of the alleged attack and of her injuries to the media. It happened very fast, not to the degree of what was reported, and it was an argument that occurred in the room for not even 10 seconds. Prosecutors were informed of her wounds only after a cop overheard doctors discussing possible causes of her injuries as she was being treated at the hospital. And here, and I'm not sure if it was Kaiser or the doctor or both, but a few days after the arrest, so September 15th, They have to go to the media to clear the record. So this was a condition she was born with that had little effect on her and was not a result of fresh trauma, said forensic pathologist Michael Baden, who reviewed the information. The Manhattan District Attorney's Office declined to comment on whether it intended to drop the assault charge based on the broken vertebrae. We see that they removed one of the assault charges, but not the strangulation charge since this article. Kondrzyzik's attorney said his client was particularly frustrated. The complaint says she reported that Porter choked her so hard that she had difficulty breathing. According to her, she wasn't being strangled. That was an exaggeration. She doesn't want the public to think that what was said by the government were her words. And at this point, Gundrizik hadn't spoken to the district attorney's office yet. When contacted by the Post, the DA's office didn't address Gundrizik's claims and instead pointed to the outcomes of the court proceedings a day earlier, where they are still charging Kevin Porter Jr. with second-degree strangulation and third-degree assault. We've given them numerous opportunities to come clean and fix false information, but they have yet to do so, Gundrizik said of the DA's office. My privacy, or my relationship, shouldn't be publicized to catapult careers. Her lawyer, Robert Hantman, added that they both liaised with the DA's office in recent weeks to clarify the record. It shouldn't be dramatized just because he's a basketball player, she is a basketball player, and they're a celebrity-type couple. And that's not all. It's not just the strangulation charge similarity where the news media picked up on it instantly and the DA's office is like, oops, we just overheard it and heard it wrong. Sorry. They're also alleging a prior history of abuse uh, by Kevin Porter Jr. against Kaiser Gondrasic, something that we've seen them do in the Jonathan Majors case when the physical evidence, the, the evidence available of the night of March 24th and 25th, don't point to Jonathan Majors being the one committing harassment and assault against their partner. Assistant Manhattan District Attorney Mira Kurzer said Porter has a history of abusing Gundrizik, including an incident in which he rammed his car into hers. And that's the context that we have about that. And when this all happened, 
Kaiser's sister went off on Instagram saying, if you think you're going to touch my sister and not get touched, count your fucking days. Better hope and pray you'll be able to ever walk again, let alone dribble. You may have gotten away with this in the past because your mama ain't beat your ass, but we spank little punk and painting nail sissy bitch like you every day. Don't show up to that crib. We don't do it to you, little B. She went bananas because she heard the news. And then I'm sure her sister had to be like, girl, hold up. And like, but that's serious, right? Because these false allegations don't just have legal repercussions, but someone could hear something and then, you know, vigilante justice. You can take justice into your own hands. And a false accusation can lead to something like this, where, you know, it could have caught the sister an assault charge over something that didn't even happen. And anyway, I think her sister Calabria used to date um, Dwayne Haskins, the NFL player, and I'm pretty sure she knocked his teeth out, or at least it was reported that, or said online somewhere, that she punched him and knocked his teeth out. So I wouldn't want someone falsely accusing me and then someone who got a good punch stepping up to me about something I didn't even do. And then before we look at some of Kaiser Gondrizic's quotes to TMZ and the Roland Martin show, the case is still ongoing, and at a recent hearing, November 27th, the DA's office offered a plea deal. At today's appearance, the people made the following offer on the record. If he pleads guilty to assault in the third degree, a misdemeanor, and completes abusive partner intervention programming, or equivalent programming, and abides by the temporary order of protection, he would be able to replead to harassment in the second degree, a violation, with a final limited order of protection. And that would allow Kevin Porter Jr. to avoid jail time as time served, and where I wanted to bring that whole and Lauren Victoria Burke really like bird's eye views into it is let's hear the plea that was offered. We don't know about a plea offered to Jonathan Majors. We know he obviously went to court. We know that Adam Foss went to trial as well. We just read the deal that Kevin Porter Jr. Oh, just plead guilty to the assault and do a partner abuse program. So basically, it's like admitting that you're an abusive person to intimate partners. And let's look at the deal that the same DA offered Adam Foss. One thing about this case, which is is so terrifying and should make everybody really terrified about what's happening in Alvin Bragg's office, is right. as, as the offer made in this case, I've never heard in my 25 years as a defense lawyer. This is the offer made by the DA's office. And, and that is to Adam Foss. To Adam Foss. Got, got it. Now, again, they charged him with a rape charge that had a five-year, at least, mandatory minimum prison sentence that would have had a lifetime of sex offender registration. That's what That was what was at stake. The offer was that they would dismiss the case entirely against Foss on three conditions, all of which are illegal, unethical, and unheard of. One, that he goes into court and he admits that he actually did rape her. All that achieves is making sure that Adam Foss cannot sue Alvin Bragg, which, by the way, he is doing, and, and we can talk about that, and also ensures that this false accuser can sue Adam Foss and win. Two, and this is terrifying, that he never showed the evidence to anyone, that he spent his whole life walking around saying it was dismissed, but I can never prove to you that I didn't do it. And three, that he never, quote, changed the narrative. So, uh, he so never say, I am innocent. So you and they would have dismissed the case entirely. So he was fully acquitted in November. And then again, same deal here. So you plead guilty, you do this partner intervention program, you look like uh, someone that abuses their partners, and we will bring, it's fine, we'll even reduce it down to harassment. Say time served. And it's kind of like, is that really even justice for the victims? If you really believe that this happened, is time served justice for if you really believe someone had their neck fractured or whatever because you still drop the strangulation charge? Is that justice to say, oh, sign this, say that we were right, and don't fight this in, in court by going to trial with it? Is that justice for the victims? Kaiser's mom went bananas on Mira Kurzer. I highly recommend watching this in full. Um, I'll link to it in the description. But you're just atta attaching all of this for a storyline? Well, first of all, I completely hear you. This must be so overwhelming to see in the press what we're saying, and you're not getting as much information from us as we would like you to get. So I'm so sorry about how this... Oh, is no, no, this isn't, so this isn't about us getting information about what you all have, and you all releasing information to us. It's about information that you're releasing that Kaiser has not given a voice to 
She has not given you a statement. She has not given you any consent to release any of her records, any of her information with her, her, her physical status or any injuries that you sat there and said, oh, I'm sorry for, because in order to what, to make you all's case for, 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 for today, for court, for the arraignment, that you the made those statements? And she didn't give you permission to do that. So she's talking about the statement that, oh, he struck me in the head multiple times and put his hands around my throat, causing bruising, and I was diff having difficulty breathing. This is the statements that were part of the complaint and read during arraignment that the news, the reporters in the courtroom were taking and relaying to the media, and they were framed to be statements from Kaiser, who didn't make those statements, so she says. And, sorry, but it's a pattern now. I'm inclined to believe that it's possible that these statements were not made in the way they're claimed to have been made by the people they're claiming to have made them. They asked me to record me to give a statement. I told them that I could not give one. I didn't feel comfortable doing that. They asked me to write a statement. I asked them, I said, are you allowed to write a statement for me? They said, no, legally we are not allowed to. But then next thing you know, I see a criminal complaint that is filled out by police officers. And I have a supervisor who called me in October and told me that the criminal complaint was filled out by what officers believed to have happened at the time, as I recorded that conversation as well. We have Mira Kurzer here saying, you know, we didn't put that in the media. They got it from the court. But what they're getting from the court is you saying someone said something that never said something. So whether you're spoon feeding the press or you're preparing the bowl for them to help themselves, the press is still getting it and doing astronomical damage with these stories that aren't substantiated or they're not happening the way that you're saying they're happening. This same language that this statement was written and being written by someone, even though Kaiser wasn't writing it. And Jabari wrote the second half of the one page and then signed it. The NBA player allegedly hit Gundrizik multiple times and placed his hands around her neck. So we have the same recurring thing. That's what Sergeant Hansen also said, that Jabari said, he struck me in the head multiple times and put his hands around my throat. Or grabbed me by the throat was the language that he used. Now, the difference with Grace Jabari is that we have her signed statements and we also have her saying that she prepared page two of the domestic incident report, the first one. Um, before she came and amended the language when the strangulation charge was dropped. But we also do have the body cam footage, which Grace testified to, where she was asking, what did he do to me? Did he hurt me? What happened to my finger? What happened to my ear? And we don't actually get to hear the audio. We only get to hear her confirm statement by statement. Did you, are you saying this? Did you say this out loud? So an overlap there with the difference being that we don't have interviews with Gundrizik. We don't have signed statements from Gundrizik. She was instead saying she wasn't comfortable giving a statement, whereas with Jabari, we do have the signed statement. She wrote the second page. She did speak to the police officers in the closet as well as at the hospital. And she also texted her friends, and some of that came in through as testimony. Then he is being wrongfully charged. That, that, Absolutely. So you're saying that what they are alleging, what he is being charged with, charged with is absolutely, positively, 100% completely false and if if you're saying that that means those charges should be dropped absolutely that is why one of them have been dropped already and they've already offered this man a plea deal of no jail time that they didn't report but they have it out in the general public into the media that he's still facing two charges there's so much information that they're withholding because they are refusing to take accountability for their actions and manipulating this entire case to catapult their own Third, Kaiser says, he's never been physical with me before. And in the year and a half, the two of you were together, there was never an instance of any physical altercations, anything along those lines? Not at all. And it's, and it's unfortunate to know that the people, um, the organization, the, the Rockets, you know, just five days before this incident, we were out to dinner with the general manager and his wife. You had the owner of the organization say that out of all the players that he's ever had, that Kevin was by far his favorite. And it we have the DA's office shifting their story that now that their initial claims have been kind of poked holes through. Oh, now Porter has a history of abusing Gundrizik. But we just heard, no, never. But that clearly has, has, has to be angering you that the DA's office is just standing firm on this and by saying, well, 
we got a complaint we have to prosecute, but you are the alleged victim who's saying it didn't happen. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm very angry. I'm, I'm disappointed. I'm shocked. You know, you never believe that things can happen to you until they happen to you, right? God. I'm not going to be quiet. I'm going to continue to speak my truth until the day you come forward and acknowledge what you have done wrong. And if you've done it to someone else, speak about that as well because they've been too comfortable doing this to me that I doubt this will be their first nor their last time. Because if they did it to me, they'll do it to someone else. So we've got three cases here. And thank you, Jimmy. I think Flavio and I think Jesse. There's been a few people that pointed me in the direction of the Adam Foss case. I know Jimmy pointed out what's going on with Kaiser Gundrizic. And, you know, when you put it all together, those shared elements, the concept of cops filling out the statements and saying that it came from someone else or the prosecution sitting on exculpatory evidence or the prosecution trying to bring a case through any means necessary just to get a guilty plea or conviction and then when the facts of the case don't line up they drop one charge but keep it going just the idea and I'm sure there aren't people that are going to be shocked by this but just the idea that we would even have to screenshot email correspondence or record conversations that we have on the phone with an ADA. You know, in concept, that's not what prosecutors are for. Prosecutors are supposed to pursue justice, not fight to win. So shout out to Lauren Burke. Shout out to everyone who has sent these cases forward. But in any case, this doesn't stop with one case. And again, I hate to compare the facts of any one case against another, but we're seeing the same type of strategy that's being pursued in an effort to win a conviction rather than win justice. And if it can happen to Kaiser Gundrizic, Kevin Porter Jr., Adam Foss, Jonathan Majors, maybe even a little bit Grace Jabari, because for a while people thought she wasn't cooperating, that these statements may have just been bad police work. And maybe it's a combination. We do have her testimony now, but maybe it only got so far for her because she felt like she couldn't stop the, the snowball once it was rolling. You know, this shouldn't be the way things work. The prosecution bears the burden of proof to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt against their defendant for any of the charges they claim against somebody. And to me, this pattern of what we're seeing with the Manhattan DA, especially, although I'm sure it's not limited to the Manhattan DA, is not okay. And Kaiser's right. We have to talk about it. Jimmy's right. We have to show up for it. Danny's right. We have to show up for it. Lauren Victoria Burke is right. And shout out to her because her video putting this together, she, I think she has a great voice, very concise, easy to listen to. Mine, I'm kind of long-winded and like yappy. But she's doing great work, especially for only, you know, she reports on politics and she stepped into the Jonathan Majors case at the tail end of testimony and caught right up to speed and to seeing a pattern, what I think is an apparent pattern with the Manhattan DA. And then all of you guys out there pointing out cases that are like this, pointing out details of the cases that point to poor police work or shoddy DA workings and all of that. Even if you want things to be better, you don't care about Kevin Porter Jr., the one with the charges. Maybe you just want to see Kaiser. Maybe you believe she's a victim despite what she's saying. Maybe you think she's just protecting Kevin Porter Jr. All of this is creating stress and loss of opportunity for her as well. So... The way the Manhattan DA's office is moving isn't really just something that the impact is limited to the defendants in these cases. It's something that's dragging everybody else down at the same time. So who is, who is any of it a win for? That's my question. It used to be that prosecutors, especially this district attorney's office under prior district attorneys, not Alvin Bragg, they would not bring a case unless they had a good faith belief that they could prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. This style of pursuit of justice by DAs like the Manhattan DA, like Alvin Bragg's office, who wins from it? And it can happen to anybody. So that's all I've got. Let me know your thoughts on any similarities that you notice between these. If you think they're not similar at all, if you think the prosecution is just doing what it has to do, because that might be the only way it could convict someone who's actually guilty. You know, obviously everything has a little bit of gray area. Not everything's black and white, but maybe that's a bad example to use in this situation because we've got, in my cases, are talking about three, three black men. But you know what I mean. Figure of speech aside, let me know your thoughts on anything and everything we've talked about in this video or beyond. You guys take care. Have a good one. Links will be in the description. Shout out again to 
Jimmy, Jesse, Flavio, Lauren, Victoria, Burke, everyone following not just what any of these individual cases, but the big picture and advocating for things to be done better. You guys take care.